Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. Today's presenter is Dr. Aaron Coe. His topic is The Urgency of Our Times. It was 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell and there was a preacher that was at Hungary and he was invited to go into one of the universities in Hungary to talk about astronomy. And he was very puzzled. So why do you want me to go to the university to talk about astronomy? Because he's not an astronomer. He's a theologian. He's a preacher. And the invitation from the president of one of the universities says, I want you to tell the students how does God exist in the world of astronomy? And he says, okay, in my lifetime of preaching, I only have one slide about astronomy. And, um, but, but the president said to him, but there's a catch. I want to give you an hour to speak about astronomy and how God exists in astronomy. But before that, we're going to have one of our lecturers who's an astronomer to, to tell the students why God did not exist. And he was puzzled. He, saw, he, know, he knew that he was being set up. And he says that, look, I'm, since I'm a guest, I'll let him speak first and I'll speak second. So in order for him to speak second, so he knew what he was going to speak, so he can actually have some time to try and refute what he's going to talk about. So when the day came, something happened. Um, the president rushed to him in, in, during that time and said, look, we have a problem. He said, what's the problem? The problem is the, the lecturer is unable to make it because he has an appointment somewhere else. And he said, oh, great. I have two hours then. I'm going to spend one hour telling you about astronomy and why God exists, and then I'm going to spend an hour answering questions. So he sp spent that one hour talking about astronomy, talking about the heavens, about the earth, and God created the stars and the heaven. And at the end of that one hour, it was time for answering questions. And as he was answering some of the questions, he overlooked into the lecture room, and he saw one of the students looking to the side, and one of the PhD, the faculty member, was asking the student to ask that preacher a question. And he knew that he's going to be set up. And the question was, as he stood up, yes, we've heard what you have said about astronomy, about God exists. But one of our astronomers, Yuri Gorgin, astronomer has gone up to space and he didn't see God. If you haven't seen God, how does he exist? And that preacher took a step back and he started to ask a question back. If there's a possibility, let's take the religion out of the picture. And he asked back to the faculty, in the things that you know in astronomy, that you've studied all these years in your PhD, how much do you know of all the knowledge of astronomy available to you right now, how many percent of this knowledge would you know? 100%? They shook their head. Perhaps 70% that all there is to know about astronomy, all there is to know, because you have the PhD, you are, you're, you're a specialist in this view. Do you know at least 70% of what there is to know about astronomy? And they shook their head. 50% and they shook their head. 30% and they shook their head. Then he said to them, let's say, because you guys are a prestigious university, there must be, let's, let's do it that way. Let's say if your students knew 5% or, of all there is to know about astronomy, let's say 5%, that would intellectually mean that you do not know the 90% of what there is to know about astronomy. And if you do not know the 95% of that is to know about astronomy, could God lies in that 95%? And it was profound. And another question was opposed to them. 
that let's say in this world, there's only two choices in life. One, there is no God. God does not exist at all. You live your life, you're born by chance, by evolution, and you're born and you live this life, you have your sufferings, and then you die, you get buried, and the worms eat you up. And that's it. And that's it. But if there is a remote chance that God did exist, that He came to this world, He fashioned you, He created you, He gives you, He gives you strength, He gives you courage, He looked after you throughout your whole life. And then when you accept Him as your Savior, you will live for the rest of your life and eternity. If that is that a remote chance, which one would you choose? Just put religions like, if that was the two choice, which one would you choose? The faculty acknowledge and they said, the latter one, the latter one. You know, God exists in our lives. And Werner Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg in 1932, he was a scientist. He was the father of quantum physics. And this is what he has to say. He says that the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. Albert Einstein, and he says, the more one penetrates into the nature's secrets, the greater become one's respect for God. And we're talking about the smartest scientists in the world. Even they, despite the theories that they have discovered, they knew there's a higher power, and that's God. So Isaac Newton, the great mathemat mathematician, He's a philosopher, a great physicist, and he discovered the first and the second and the third law of motion that would change the world and set the foundation of modern science. The discoveries that would dominate the sciences for three centuries had such a profound interest that he said this, that he who thinks half-heartedly will not believe in God, but he who really thinks has to believe in God. So Isaac Newton wrote this book, The Observations Upon the Prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John. He had such an interest on this revelation, the Bible, that he actually wrote a book about it. You know, we are always wondering about the prophecies. We want to know the future. And so were the disciples of Christ who wanted to know the future. And the disciples, in at a time when Jesus was alive, in Matthew 24, verse 3, the disciples were asking Jesus, he said that you'll be coming, but when will the sign of your coming and be of the end of the age? But Jesus said something very profound. And he says, therefore, when you see the abominations of desolation spoken by who? Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and whoever reads, let him understand. Jesus himself told his disciples that the importance of the book of Daniel and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Isaac Newton knew something profound. He knew something divine. He knew there was something incredible about the book of Daniel, and it troubled him. So much so, he dug into the scripture, and he started to write a book about Daniel and Revelation. Just like King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he had a dream, a dream that was given unto him, and that troubled him as well. But what was this dream? And the thing is that it, it troubled so much that his sleep left him. We're going to explore a little bit about Daniel chapter 2 and his dream, and what profound indications that he has for our society today. And Let's turn to our book, Bible, Daniel chapter 2. If you have a Bible, turn the Bible to Daniel chapter 2, verse 2. And the Bible says, Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. And they came and stood before the king. And the king said to him, I have had a dream. My spirit is anxious to know about a dream. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king in the room and they say, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret 
give the interpretation. Now, how many of you have a dream when you wake up and you can't remember? Yes, we all have. We wake up and we can't remember. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he couldn't remember the dream. And, but the thing is, the difference is, he was so troubled, but he has a request to be made. He called all the wise people in the Babylon and says, you tell me my dream and give me the interpretation. Now, is it an easy thing to do? No. If King Nebuchadnezzar hypothetically had a dream and he tells them the dream, all the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the magicians will be able to give their interpretation because anyone can interpret the dream however they want. But God gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream, but he made him forget and he is anxious. And he says, therefore, give me the dream. And the Chaldeans protested. They say, how do we, how can we do this? We can't give you the interpretation unless you give me the dream. And they say, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. But there was someone by the name of Daniel. And he was the man of God. We knew that from, from the previous before. He was the chosen one. And so Daniel went in and told the king, he said, King, give me some time. Let's turn to the Bible. Let's turn to the Bible. In chapter, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 16. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 16. The Bible reads, So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went into his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You look, this was serious because Nebuchadnezzar actually said, if you do not tell me the dream and interpretation, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And there was a death decree that was being sent out. And the king was very furious in Daniel chapter 2, verse 12. Drop your eyes on there. And he says that for this reason, the king was very angry and very furious, and he gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Was Daniel among the wise men? Yes. And so the decree went out, and what did they do? They began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companion to kill him. As they were killing the Chaldeans, the magicians, and the astrologers, Daniel proposed to the king to say, give me some time. And what they did was they went in. You see, the, in times, sometimes when things, troubles come into our life, sometimes when you have been diagnosed with disease, when you feel that there's nothing that you could do, sometimes when you have a relationship with your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or girlfriend, where you're so severe that you find that you have nowhere to go. Sometimes in our life, when we lost our jobs, we lost our loved ones, and we just do not know what to do. But Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, they did not know what to do, but they just know what to do. They prayed. They come together and seek the heaven of God. In verse 18, that this, the Bible says that they might seek the mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companion might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel prayed. You know, how do you sleep at night with all the anxieties knowing that your death decrees is on your head? And the Bible says in Psalms chapter 4 verse 8, I will take my rest on my bed in peace because you only, Lord, keep me safe. With the assurance of God, in spite of the anxieties and troubles of the world, we can find peace and God can let us have that rest. And Daniel, and uh, there's no wise man in the world that could ever reveal secret. But Daniel says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the last days. You know, in the, U in the U.S. Treasury building, there are 800 doors, but there's one key. There's 800 doors and there was one master key. You know, what is the key to the doors of life? What's the key for the perplexities and the suffering and the, and the uh, trials and tribulations in our life? The key lies in God because He's the one who fashioned us 
and He created us. He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And the dream was revealed to Daniel. And Daniel approached King Nebuchadnezzar and tell him, I know the dream. And he says, and revealed the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. And, God, and Daniel says, this is the dream. And now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. So come with me as we unravel the secrets of that dream and what God has to tell King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel says, you, O king, are the king of kings. You are the, this head of gold. Babylon ruled from 605 to 539 BC. And it was in the dream, Babylon was the head of gold. You know, Babylon at that time, current Babylon has, is no longer here on this earth. But where it was, it was in ancient Iraq. But as we look at Iraq now, it was a state of not what it was before. The Babylon of that time in Iraq was a splendor. It's one of the seven wonders of the world of that time. They have hanging gardens. They have 20 years supply of food. They was structured in such a strategic place that the Euphrates River runs directly through the middle city of Babylon. Babylon comes from the word Babel, and Babel means confusion. Remember we talked about before, Jerusalem represents righteousness. Jerusalem represents God's people. Jerusalem represents purity, peace. But Babylon represents splendor, luxury, alluring, confusion. Babylon is about 16 kilometers around compared to Rome. It was quite smaller. And we know that in the middle of, of Babylon, there was a big temple, about 19 meters in height, approximately about six to eight stories high, was the temple of Bel Marduk. Bel Marduk, it was such a big temple for them that Nebuchadnezzar worshipped Bel Marduk that he invested eight and a half tons of solid gold in the interior of that temple. That is about 7,727 kilograms of solid gold used from the altar of throne. Could you imagine when Daniel and his friends were taken from Jerusalem as they walked into the Babylon, they saw the hanging gardens, they saw the majestic city of Babylon where gold were everywhere. They were in awe. And God says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. This was what Babylon used to look like, the ring enactment. And uh, we could see there, that's the Ishtar Gate right there. And um, that's the temple of Bel Maduk. And um, the walls are so wide that two chariots could run concurrently across the wall. And it was a majestic city of that time. This is the Ishtar Gate, the reenactment, not the real one, but um, in, uh, in Iraq. And, um, and it still exists here today. And um, we have another picture here of uh, giving a bit of a uh, background of where the city of Babylon is. And this, they actually had this one in, um, in a museum, in a museum in, in Europe. They actually took the actual bricks and they built it up to form this Ishtar gate. And after Babylon, Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar, there will be another kingdom. Your kingdom, the Babylon that you see right now, is big, it's majestic, it's formidable. But your kingdom will not last forever, for there will be another kingdom. And that kingdom, its chest, and it's, it will be arms of silver. And what is that chest and arms of silver? It belongs to Middle Persia. The Persian conquered Babylon in 539 to 331 BC. The Bible actually predicted and told Nebuchadnezzar that your kingdom will not last forever because another kingdom will arise. But how? Sometimes we, he can't get into his mind because he has a fortress that is impenetrable. He has 20 years supply of his food that his people will not starve. How would that happen? The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 5, that something actually happened. When Nebuchadnezzar fell and he, well, he, he passed away, he passed the kingdom 
to his son and then to his grandson, Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Belshazzar at that time was complacent. He says, I have a kingdom that was passed on to me. No other countries would ever penetrate into my, into my kingdom. We're going to have a drunken feast. So he had a drunken feast for a thousand of his lords. There were wine everywhere. There was women. There was song. It was a drunken orgy. As the wine was flowing, the music was playing. And suddenly something happened that caught the eye of Belshazzar. Remember I told you that in the Old Testament, God uses his hand three times. First was in Genesis, where God fashioned Adam. Number two, when he was wrote the Ten Commandments in the tablets, he used his finger. And number three, that God wrote these words on the wall. Many. What does it mean? And he summoned Daniel up and said, Daniel, tell me, what does this mean? And it meant that God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You have been weighed in and the balances were found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. How did it happen? How did it happen? King Cyrus, as we know, was infuriated. He was King Cyrus went into and took over Babylon. But how did he do it? You know, while Belshazzar was celebrating that drunken feast, Cyrus has been, and his soldiers, has been camping outside of Babylon for more than six months. They have wanting to conquer Babylon, and they did not know how to do it. And the people of Babylon, the soldiers, were so ignorant. They had so much food, they were literally throwing food down at Cyrus' soldier and mocking them and said, look, you guys are hungry. I'm going to throw you some food down. And they can't conquer them. They were mocking them. But Cyrus had a plan. Something came to his mind when one of his horses got drowned in one of the river. And he says, if we were to cut off the water supply that runs in the middle of Babylon, we will conquer it. And that's what he did. For more than six months, his soldiers dug 360 channels on the upper side of the river of Euphrates to divert the water away from the Euphrates River. And over that long period of time, the river started to drop. As it continued to drop, the gates, they would see the gates, they would march into Babylon underneath the gates and overtook the city. Did you know that God named Cyrus approximately 150 years before he was born? Before he was born, God already named Cyrus that he will invade Babylon and take over this kingdom. Let's turn to our book, our Bible in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 45, the Bible reads, Thus says the Lord to the anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. This is exactly what happened. The Bible prophecy, the, God, the word of God is true. Cyrus walked in through underneath the gates with the doors open, they marched in and overtook Babylon. Now turn with me to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, chapter 4, 5, and 5. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4 and 5. For my Jacob, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by your name, which is Cyrus. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. And that was it. Cyrus was named 150 years before. You know, in the British Museum, there was a Cyrus cylinder. And this cylinder was discovered not too long ago. And Cyrus wrote that cylinder. That discovery was discovered in 1878 at the site of Babylon. You know what they inscribed? 
they inscribed the exact way how Cyrus overtook Babylon. Exactly what the Bible says in Daniel and Isaiah. But the Middle Persia will not last forever too. And it will perish. And but who overthrew the Middle Persia? We're going through a bit of a history here and we will see a bigger picture soon. In Daniel 2, the brass represents Greece. It was the third nation that overthrew the Middle Persia. But when it comes to Daniel 8, it talks about a power described as a male goat. It says that the first king will be the world-dominating leader, and the leader was Alexander the Great. In the Bible, hundreds of years of advance, indeed the students of history realized there was a third kingdom of bronze. And the Bible says, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. Alexander the Great was a great king. At age of 33 years old, in 10 short years, he conquered the then known world. And the Bible talks about Alexander the Great. Isn't the Bible true? Absolutely. You know, the Alex Alexander the Great led their armies in their bronze armor. You know, when they were conquering the Middle Persia, they have bronze helmet, they have bronze breastplates, they have bronze shields, and bron bronze handle swords. So the bronze adequately represented Alexander the Great, Greece. And the Bible knew that way beforehand. So we have the Babylon, that image, that great image that troubled Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylon, the kingdoms after kingdoms, the Babylon, Middle Persia, and Greece. But would Greece rule forever? The Bible in Daniel chapter 2, verse 40, it says, Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. And who was that kingdom? We now know that the kingdom was Rome. From 168 BC to AD 476 were the legs of iron. It was the iron monarchy that the Rome overthrew the Greek Empire in 16, 168 BC and Rome ruled the world. And Rome reigned for more than 500 years. And it was one of the largest empires of the world. Just as you saw, the Bible says that the feet of toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron. So this kingdom will be a divided kingdom. At that time, Rome ruled the, the, the world with an iron feast. But God says that this kingdom will eventually be divided. Let's do a revision here. Babylon represented the head of gold. Persia, the chest and the arms of silver. Greece, the thigh of bronze. Rome, the leg of iron. And divided Europe of feet of iron and clay. Not a single world empire would not follow Rome and Rome will be divided. Is that what happened? The feet of iron and clay represent the divisions of Roman Empire. Let's take a step back. Can iron and clay be formed together? Can we mix them together? No, we can't. We can't mix iron and clay. And that the Bible represents that it will be divisions of the Roman Empire. And that was exactly what had happened. The, the barbarian tribes attacked the Western Europe and in the middle of the fourth century, and that was the division of the Roman Empire. It was divided into 10. The Anglo-Saxons, as we know now, is England. Franks were the French, and the, the uh, Burgundians were the Swiss, and the Alemanni were the Germans, and the Ostrogoths would no longer exist. The Vandals were North Africa, and Hiroline were the, the Italians. And we know that at that time, by 476 AD, the Rome has been divided into exactly 10 segments. Throughout history, Kings of Europe attempted to intermarriage, to try to join Euro Europe together. Were they successful? The Bible tells us in Daniel 2 verse 43, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere or stick to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Napoleon divorced his wife, Josephine, and married Louise, of Austria. 
in attempt to unite all the Europe, as prophecy predicted, he failed. And we know that Napoleon tried to unite Europe. He was in his full force trying to do what he could, but he couldn't. That was what he wrote in his journal. That was his vision. That was his goal. That was something that he wanted to achieve, that there will be one Europe, there'll be one currency, there'll be one language, there'll be one government all over Europe. After his defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon admitted, God Almighty is too much for me. The divided Europe from AD 476 till present, we're living in the times of feet of iron and clay. Hitler tried to unite one people, one empire, and one leader. He wanted to achieve what Napoleon couldn't achieve. The Brexit tells us that it, the Europe will never be together. The Europe dollar, you were trying to unite Europe at this point in time. We cannot because the Bible tells us that you will not be united. The great image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream that stirred his heart, that he could not sleep, and that troubled him. And that was given to him, the vision, the prophecy of what it is to come. And Daniel says in 234, as Daniel revealed to him the last prophecy, he says that you watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. And that stone that struck that image became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. What does that mean? Daniel goes to interpret and he says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall not be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. God will come and set up his kingdom on this earth. As we look around our society, things of a troubled times, we are exposed to so many things in this world today that we have never seen before in, the, in 10 years before. We're seeing a lot of crimes, a lot of wars. What was it like? Let's go back to Jesus' times. Let's go back when the disciples was asking Jesus, when is your coming? When are you coming again? And what are your signs of your coming and the coming of the age? Jesus said to his disciples, during the last days, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Are we seeing war in the past, in the last century? The wars that we have seen where people were displaced from their homes, children were killed. In the 20th century alone, 180 million deaths from war alone. The Black Plague took 150 million people. War, killing one another, took 180 million. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. The scientists are telling us today, on average, there's at least 35 earthquakes per, per day, and there's 12,000 to 14,000 a year. Christ also predicted the tsunamis, the cyclones, and the floods. In Luke chapter 21, verse 25, it says, the sea and the waves are roaring. Floods, major tsunamis in the 1990s. In 2018, this year, there was a hurricane. Mancud, the world's strongest storm this year that tore across Philippines and into Hong Kong, channeling at 25 kilometers per hour with wind gusts up to 300 kilometers per hour, bringing into devastation everywhere. Just two days ago, the news reported 
that Typhoon Kong Rei is reaching the shores of the islands of Okinawa, Japan. And this year alone, Typhoon Jebi and Typhoon Soluk has claimed many lives. Are we listening in tune to the signs that Jesus was talking about 2,000 years ago? Are we in tune to know that this is the time that we should come and try and reflect ourselves and look into the Bible and say, how is it going to be for our children? How are we going to raise them up? How are we going to walk through this difficulty? Is there a God who cares about us? This was a scientific report as shown. Since the 1900, there has been a sharp increase in all disasters. We're talking about drought, earthquake, extreme temperatures, famine, floods. And on the graph here, we can see that's increasing in floods and cyclones. What is going on? Is Jesus telling the truth? Babylon was no longer available. It is not here right now. So was Middle Persia. So is Greece. So is Rome the empire of Rome. We are living at the toenails of that great image. Jesus was so accurate that the nations were anxious today about such terrifying events. Jesus predicted just before the end there would be international conflicts on a global scale. In Matthew 24, Jesus outlines more than 20 signs, more than 20 of his return. And these are the signs they are being fulfilled. The false Christ and prophets, there was a, uh, a prophet who, a prophet with, you know, inverted commas, that sought himself as a reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And he resides in the Northern Europe and he was large followers in a community. They started to set up a community themselves. But we know that wasn't Jesus because the prophecies tells us about things that were to happen. There are wars and rumors of wars and cries of peace, but there is no peace. There's famines, there's pestilences, there's earthquakes, there's sexual immorality on this earth and there's never before that we have seen right now. Homes are falling apart, violence filling our lands, economic, there's, there's uncertain these days. We do not know. You know, the main problem in the 1940s, these were the main problems. People were talking, kids were, were talking out of their turn. They were chewing gum problem. They were, children were making too much noise and that was the problem. Running across the hall, they get punished for this. Cutting in line in queues, not showing politeness and not dressing appropriately for classes and littering. You know, today, what is our problem in our children that we see in school? We're seeing drug abuse. We're seeing alcohol abuse. I'm seeing in teenage pregnancy. We're seeing people ending their life prematurely. That's rape, robbery, and assault. In my clinic, day after day, I've seen people dealing with anxiety and depression. I've seen people who are using drugs. They're addicted to those drugs and they couldn't get off. These are the problems of today. I'm seeing teenage pregnancies. I'm seeing violence in the homes. I'm seeing assaults everywhere. You know what? We're in the era of brainwashing. In the facts about TV, you know, children watch an average TV about three hours a day on YouTube, and by 12, they probably have seen 1,000, 1,400, 14,000 murders on TV. There are increases of violence, foul languages, and sexual content. You know, the Bible says, if we behold these things, we will adopt into the lifestyle. What is it for our family? As we talk about the theme of preparing our family for eternity, we know that there is a savior who warns us. He wants us to open our eyes. We are suffering from a lot of things, from anxiety and depression. And these are the things are because of how the society has allowed these things to happen. We have deviated the principles of God and we need to come back to it. The Bible says in Luke, and when these things begin to happen and look up and lift up your heads for the redemption draws near. But know this, 
that in the last days, period of times will come. The Bible tells us in Revelation that these people will exist in the last days. The, the, for men will be lovers of themselves. They'll be lovers of money. That's all they want to think about. They will work seven days a week and forsake their family. They'll be boasters. They'll be proud. There'll be people who blaspheme against God and criticize God. The children will be disobedient to parents. They're unthankful. They're unholy, unloving, unforgiving. They're slanderous without self-control. These days, children, parents are not controlling the children anymore. The children are controlling their parents. Despiser of good traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure that, rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away unlike the failed predictions of psychics the bible has been so accurate for the past 3500 years from the two presentations today we have seen the power of god and his care for his people there's 800 prophetic verses in the bible 90 percent 90 percent already has been fulfilled there's only 10% that will be fulfilled in the near future. Why did God give us prophecies? Why did God tell us all these things? Because it verifies the truthfulness of God, of His Word, and it gives us the confidence that the future is in His hands. We are not just cosmic orphans. We are not alone in this world. We are not self-destined for destroy, self-destruction. Yes, famine and pestilences will come and has come, but it will not be the final word. Yes, then there's natural disasters and they're increasing exponentially, but they will not dash our hopes. Sickness, we are plagued with sickness everywhere, including my family as well. I'm not immune, even though I'm a doctor. But I will not give up hope for my people as long as God gave me the word and the strength to speak and to minister to my patient to reach out to them, to tell them that despite all these sufferings that we are facing in this world, there is a God that cares for us. His prophecies are true. There will be sorrow in this world. Tears will continue to fall, but will not be the end. Death will no longer claim. The Bible is a revelation of God's character. A love letter to His people. A love letter of hope of courage, of strength, and of faith. If we read the Bible and see suffering and torture, we are missing the great picture. God is telling us these things will come, but His love and His courage and His strength and His faith surpass anything that we we'll ever comprehend. All we need to do is to come to Him however you are right now wherever you are he is the final answer he is the key that unlocked the 800 doors in our lives god gives us hope and strength satan works in a form of fear just like babylon the confusion of the people but god has to call them out of babylon of that confusion to show them that he's the God of love. Jesus promises us that he will come again and he will. And he will set everything straight. If I do not believe in the word of God, I wouldn't be standing here before you right now. Today, as we have been through two seminars, you have heard about the health laws that God has created for us. If you have learned something new today and you want to know more, as the ushers give out the cards, I want you to make that decision in your heart to say, Lord, I've heard this truth. I do not know what to do and where to go. How am I going to change my life for the better? How am I going to teach my children? How am I going to manage my health? I have this sickness in my life that I do not know where to go. I've seen doctors after doctors. I find no answer. 
But Lord, today I've learned something and I say that I can do something that the doctors cannot do. That is to change something in my life, in my diet, to know this truth. I don't know how, but I want to seek you for strength so that I can live long and healthy life, to watch my children grow up, to watch them excel in school, to watch them be happy and to be productive and to be the men and the children of God. If today you've heard about the truth, about the God's prophecy, that now we are living in the times where we've got to make a decision, how are we going to change our lives? Can we, I don't know where to turn to. If you want to know more about God, we are able to reach out to you. To study for yourself, we offer one-to-one -one Bible study that you may learn more about what the Bible has to teach you. But you say in your heart, I don't know why, I've done so many bad things in my life. How can I come before? Jesus says, come as you are right now, as you are before Him. If today you have learned something and you want to know something more, we are able to help you. As you make this decision today, it is my prayer, my appeal to you to ask God to show you and say, God, I do not how, but show me and I'll trust you. I'll trust your leading. For one day we know the Bible says, Behold, He's coming with clouds and every eye will see Him and Jesus will come. I want you to contemplate about today's message. It's not a message of sorrow. It's not a message of discouragement, but a message of a hope that we all can have today. This message was made available from Beyond Patmos. For more resources like this, visit beyondpatmos.org. I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. What a day. 
glorious day that will be. If you have any questions or comments in relation to today's program, you can call 3ABN Australia Radio within Australia on 02 4973 3456 or from outside of Australia on country code 61 2 4973 3456. Our email address is radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. That is radio at the number 3ABN Australia, all one word. .org.au. Our postal address is 3ABN Australia Inc. PO Box 752 Morissette, New South Wales 2264 Australia. Thank you for your prayers and financial support. Have you ever wondered how we got the Bible? I mean, if this is God's Word, and how did we get it from God's mouth to this printed page that we have here today? Well, we'll look at this exact question in this episode, so stick around. How did we get the Bible? To understand this, we need to explore a few terms. Revelation, inspiration, and prophets. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This process of human beings being moved by the Holy Spirit is what we refer to as revelation. This is how God reveals Himself to a member of the human race. The revelation of God is deeply rooted in our history. And we find each time God encounters a human, we gain an insight into who and what He is. And this is the revelation. For example, in the books of Genesis, we find that God reveals Himself to Adam and Eve in the garden. This revelation tells us something about what God is, what He's like, and what He's not. Later, we see in history that God reveals Himself to more and more of humanity in different encounters, like with Noah, or Abraham, or Moses, Daniel, and all the other human authors of Scripture. Each revelation was different and was progressive. It's also important to note that these revelations were only partial. We still have not seen all of God. And yet, with each progressive revelation, we gain more and more insight into who and what God is. In Romans chapter 16, verse 25, we're told that, Now, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Progressive revelation means that God did not unfold his entire plan to humanity in the book of Genesis, or for that matter, in the entire Old Testament. The Old Testament revelation Though accurate, it's incomplete. The fullness of certain teachings cannot be completely found in the Old Testament. And this is why we have a New Testament. The second term that we use when talking about how we got the Bible is the word inspiration. This is the process of taking the revelation given by God and communicating it to a wider human audience. Sometimes this was just done orally such as in Noah's call to repentance for 120 years, or Abraham instructing his descendants. But in most cases, it involved writing a message down, such as in the cases of people like Moses and Daniel, or Jeremiah, Isaiah, and so on. The Apostle Paul tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. This word inspiration is the literal idea that the Scriptures are God-breathed. And so, with an understanding that God, through the Holy Spirit, inspired the human agent with the revelation, they used their culture, their language, and their own experiences to write down that revelation. 
This is why in the scriptures we see expressions like, and I saw, or it was something like, or he showed me, or it had the appearance of. The human language of the author was used to communicate the revelation. Christians don't believe in verbal inspiration, meaning we don't believe that God dictated each and every word of the Bible, but rather we believe in thought inspiration. This is where God gave the human agent the thought, or the revelation, which was then written down in their own words, hence the inspiration. And this brings us to our third term, prophet. What is the purpose of a prophet? Well, the Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 19, Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not listen. The meaning of the word prophet is literally God's organ or spokesman. So a prophet is literally the human instrument which God communicated his revelation to and then further on to the wider human family. Now, because the prophets were so influential, it is not surprising that in early history, false prophets appeared pretending to be God's messengers in order to support their own ambition or power and gain personal authority. However, because of this, God has given clear instructions to his people to examine the credentials of all who claim to be prophets. And this is why God has given a number of tests to use when we think we may have a prophet in our midst. These include the true prophet receives visions and dreams, Numbers 12, 6. A true prophet's predictions must come to pass 100% of the time. Jeremiah 28, 9. A true prophet's message will be in complete harmony with the entire revealed word of God and the law of God. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4 and Isaiah 8, 20. A true prophet prophesies to edify the church with counselings and testimonies. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 4. A true prophet will exalt Christ as the Son of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. A true prophet will bear good fruit, which is their character. Matthew 7, 16 through 20. The true prophet, when in vision, will exhibit physical signs. But these are secondary to all the previous tests. Numbers 24, 4 and Daniel 10, 11 through 17. So in case you missed it, God used the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to the human mouthpiece called the prophets. And these prophets either communicated that revelation orally or by writing it down. Most of these written revelations, which were inspired by the Holy Spirit, are what we would now call the different books of the Bible. And in order to know if a human is really chosen as a prophet, The Bible gives us a number of tests that we can apply to their life and teachings so that we can be sure. And that is how we got the Bible. Have a blessed day. It's been our pleasure bringing you this program today here on 3ABN Australia Radio.